I'm here at Crib Point and I'm about to meet the amazing team from SADA, Search and Rescue Dogs Australia. This is an obstacle course that they use to train their very special dogs. It's going to be a really fun episode. I'm Sarah Jones, welcome to Dog Jobs Australia. Nestled in the scrub, somewhere along the coastline near Crib Point, is a secret training location. Training here are a crew of top dogs who specialise in search and rescue scenarios and are used in operations all over the country. Today, I'll be meeting with the team from SADA, otherwise known as Search and Rescue Dogs Australia. So Julie, tell me, how long have you been involved with SADA? Um, we, uh, a friend of mine and I started SADA off in 1994. Uh, was after being competition obedience, competition tracking, and also acknowledging the use of um, dogs in avalanche rescues, uh, land rescues, bush searching. So we started to look around and research how they go about the area search because we'd only ever had tracking as on lead work. So from there, um, we moved along and we had other people come into the team and, and train with their dogs. We all trained our own dogs. And we moved through the area search, bush searching in 1997 when Threadbow happened. Um, it was uh, no dogs in Australia that can do urban search and rescue, which is disaster rescues where people are trapped under rubble. Um, and, and so that was another area. So I started to travel overseas to learn from um, in Europe and the US, you know, how this is done with the dogs, watch the dogs learning, watch the dogs operational. So we've been a, an entity which has been acknowledged by all the emergency service agencies ever since for uh, having deployable um, rescue dogs mm. and dogs that are, uh, can search, locate, alert. In your visit today, we're gonna to show you how a dog searches through the bush and how he alerts and then how we rescue and then we just relay it on to the um, ambulances if they're, or the search managers that we've found somebody. Um, and these dogs have to be um, fluent in agility and scent discrimination. For example, when uh, you know there's search parties out looking in the bush, the dog's got to know that that's not who he's looking for. Mm. So if possible, we get them to, to send everybody in the area before we set out. Oh, so if you're working with other searchers, with police, that sort of thing, that's they it. get centred first? Yes. Mm. Oh, well, look, when it's possible. But the dogs know um, when when the, um, the person is injured, trapped or whatever, the adrenaline comes off them. And right, so they smell different. They smell different. And, you know, it's the bacteria and the breath that we have to locate, the dogs have to locate first and foremost. Mm. So anyone else walking through the bush, um, it, it's, not, it's not a... Uh, he might run up to him and say, are you? No, I'm not. No, you're not. And then just move on. But That's they incredible, will, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. I often say to people when I'm giving um, discussions, uh, blood, the bacteria and blood recycles and circulates a lot quicker. So just cut yourself if, you, if you're if lost or trapped in the bush. Well, that's a good <laughs> so, tip. Good to know. I'll, I'll store that away yeah, in the back yeah. there. Uh, we have one member who's been with us forever and he is such a great uh, victim. And when we do building searches, um, if, he's, if Collingwood's been playing on the night before, he gets on the garlic pizza and beer, and, and we really don't need a dog to find him. You, so could, you could probably sniff him out, we you reckon? Could sniff him, yeah. <laughs> yep. The dogs are sort of go nose in the air, and they're gone. Yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, look, we have some dedicated people that come along every week without a dog, and they just want us to be able to survive um, and keep training to a um, an operational level. Mm. And we've got some really good people, which is the main thing now. Mm. And uh, so it's probably a legacy that, that I'd like to leave. We are 
um, affiliated with Victoria Police Search and Rescue, uh, Missing Persons and SES and um, so, you know, any time of bush, bush search and rescue, um, we can go on searches with um, being deployed by any of those agencies. So Tank doesn't really want <laughs> to look at the camera. No, Tank, Tank, Tank has realised that there's a sausage sizzle maybe oh, happening okay. at the back there and is slightly <laughs> distracted, but that's fine. I'm distracted by sausage sizzles as well. After the break, more awesome dogs doing more awesome things. You're watching Dog Jobs Australia. about to chat with Alex, who's currently training her young dog, Kaya, for cadaver scent detection. So hi Alex, we're here with the youngest member of the Sada family. Yeah. Uh, can you introduce us to this so, lovely lady? So this is Kaya and she's a six month old German short hair pointer. Oh, beautiful. Um, so you have two, two German sh short hair pointers involved in, the, in, in Sada. Um, what sort of work do, are they involved in? So my adult, who's now three years old, she's um, trained for live finds and so urban search and rescue and bush search and rescue or Lanza um, and Kai is actually going to be trained as a human remains detection dog. Wow fantastic so you've got a lot of hard work in front of you. Yeah. Um, so has has um, she started this process yet? Yep so um, Kai started when she was eight weeks old just imprinting on scent. Wow eight weeks old that seems to me really really young. So dogs essentially come out of the womb learning, mm -hmm. um, much like people, but I guess um, with the time frames, obviously dogs mature a lot faster. So people are of this thought that dogs should wait till they're you know, 12 months old, 18 months old, fully mature before they, you start training them. But in reality, you can imprint on scent pretty much from four or five weeks, wow. really early on. Yeah. yeah, and maybe the earlier is, is the better in terms of how, how great they're going to be at it going forward. Yeah, because I guess um, the whole point is that they learn that this one scent equals a reward. And right. the earlier on you teach that, the I guess the stronger the association is. Mm. What sort of, when you talk about reward, what sort of reward, is that a food reward? Yeah, so she yeah. is trained on a food reward. Okay. She is a bit of a gut. Yeah. Um, so yeah, food works for her. So do you need to sort of work out for each dog which reward works best? Yeah. So with live find dogs, toy is usually best because it's not really practical to be feeding dogs. Right. Um, but with detection, it's a little bit different because um, you're not, you don't have a human victim that the dog has to come out and find and, and come back to you. Whereas in detection, you're very up close with the dog and then you see them indicate an alert and that's when you can reward them with the food. Fantastic. So I imagine when you're training a dog to, to track a lost person, that process is made simpler by the fact that you can have a human volunteer with a cadaver dog. Um, that sounds a lot more complicated. How are you training on that scent? Um, so essentially we are using human remains. There are schools of thought that you can use what's called pseudo scent, which is okay. essentially fake smelling stuff. Yep. But if you really want a dog to be really reliable, you need to use the real stuff. Right, right. And that must be a bit tricky to source, I imagine, legally. Yes, it is. In Australia, there are a lot of laws around the proper disposal of human remains mm -hmm. and you can't buy or sell them. So we essentially ask people to donate and people do wow. very generously donate parts, yeah. Um, what sort of parts are we talking about? I'm sure people aren't donating a finger or anything like that. <laughs> well, you, you try, but no. Um, <laughs> A really popular one is teeth, when people have oh, teeth okay, extracted. Yep, yep. Um, we have placenta, there are, right. we've, we've also had um, old medical skeletons um, sure. donated to us, so they're usually made from real bone. Mm. Uh, we've also had our own trainer actually donate her fresh bone hip after she had a hip replacement. Wow, uh, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. That's dedication to the job. Yeah, and you know, that's pretty much why we really really rely on people being generous enough to donate yeah. those kinds of things and I guess a lot of people are very um, icky about it which is you know fair enough I'm donating parts of whatever but in reality you know it's it's our bread and butter it's the only way that we can train these dogs to find missing people. Yeah and it is for such an incredible cause yeah. if you can you know um, help out with a search and get closure for people that must be incredible. Yeah well that's that's the ultimate aim. Mm. Now I want to hear more about this hip bone donation. When, oh, two years ago I had uh, my hip replaced. Yeah. And I asked the, the surgeon and the CEO of the hospital if I could have my hip 
because they, they you can donate your body parts to science, but sure. the recipient has to be of, of note. Yes. So anyway, they they had, um, and it was a private hospital in yeah. Mornington, so they did the, you know, the background and whatever. And so I went in, had the surgery. The surgeon said, I'll leave it in the en suite in a bucket, you know, la, la, la. So that was okay. All went very, very well. Uh, two days later, um, the nurses came in and I had a nighty on that had cats all over it. Mm. And they said, oh, you're a cat person. And I said, no, no, I'm a dog person. And the other one said, um, oh, um, there's a lady in the hospital. She's had her hip replaced and she's going to be able to take her hip bone home to feed her dog. <laughs> not quite. And not I quite said, what you were planning with no, it. No, and I said, oh, can I just correct you there? And <laughs> I said, that's me and it's not going home for a meal. And I explained to them what it was for. Now, my hip bone is, is such a, um, a reliable resource yeah. um, and it decomposes and with the training that I've done from overseas the decomposition of, of human remains varies sure. so you know we don't want it to decompose into absolutely nothing mm. um, but um, yeah so we've got a trip this year up to the body farm in New South wow. Wales yeah. and the New South Wales Fire and Rescue to work with So their, you bring the dogs all up the there dogs. and it's a little yep. excursion for them? It is, sure. yes. So we've got a couple of workshops up there, um, hoping these international trainers will be able to, to come out. So, But it's always training, always. We never rest on our laurels, um, always finding new places to train. Speaking of training, it's back to Alex and Kaya. So we are going to see Kaya do a little bit of training today. Yeah. What sort of things are you going to ask from her? So today I will put Kaya onto just a scent rack, just a very basic scent discrimination activity where we use a piece of equipment that's got a whole bunch of slots there and I believe we'll have two sources out, so a bone and also a tooth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she has to detect in which hole they are. Yeah. Are you anticipating she's going to be very successful or are we still in a period where we're working all that out? No, she definitely does uh, alert when she needs to. We are, we are finalising what the alert's going to actually look like. So for now it's usually, you know, sitting down and paying more attention to it, putting her nose uh -huh. on it or sometimes scratching. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what that develops to. I guess you yeah. need that, that uh, alert to be really clear. You yeah. want it to be really definitive. At the moment, we've just been working on imprinting on the scent, so she's very clear about what she's looking for. Um, and then, yeah, the alert will, what the final alert will be, will follow. Um, so what's the sort of timeline that you'd hope to have her assessed by? So it usually takes two years to train a detection dog um, up until they're ready for assessment. Doesn't, that doesn't seem like that long, really, in the, in the scheme of things. They've got so much to learn. They do, um, but it is, it's also a commitment, so it's not something that you just do, sure. you know, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's not something that you just do once a month or, you know, you don't trial for shows. It's, it's every single day you're thinking about, you know, ways that you can train your dog and improve outcomes. Mm, but that sounds like it would be really fantastic for the dogs, like lots of stimulation. Yes, it's, for them. it's very much very mentally rewarding and very tiring for them. So, it's, it, you know, you can have a dog like this run for three, four hours a day and they'll still get back up and keep going. But with, you know, with a full day of training, that's enough for the rest of the day and for the next day. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of dogs need that mental stimulation, don't they? Yes, they do. So not every dog could be, could be a working dog, but uh, some some are very keen, obviously. <laughs> You're very keen, aren't you? Yes, very keen. <laughs> so, Alex, we are going to see Kaya in action doing some training with this amazing contraption. Can you introduce us? Yep, so this is a scent rack. It's a fundamental tool to start dogs off in scent discrimination. Mm -hmm. So, essentially what you do is as you see, there's a, a, a whole bunch of containers here and you put your source or your scent source into one of them and you teach the dog to find, to pretty much just search the rack and hit on the scent and then you're going to be expecting the final trained response. Fantastic. So not every not every little container is filled with something, they just have to use their nose and, and work it out. Yeah, they, they essentially need to work out and they need to tell you where it is because okay. there's no point in me telling her where it is. No. Um, she needs to tell me. Yeah. And at the end she gets some form of reward? Yes, so she is very food motivated, so I've been training her um, through a clicker and food reward. Fantastic. Now you mentioned that 
Kai is doing cadaver training. So what sort of objects are hidden in here? Do I, I dread to ask? So we do have an uh, old bone from an old medical skeleton. Yep. And also um, one of our members donated a tooth after they had an extraction. So okay. we've got a tooth Wonderful. in there as well. Well, wonderful. I'm really excited to see her in action. Can't wait to show you. We're about to witness a training drill that aims to teach these special dogs how to accurately locate humans trapped in tight spaces. Well, Sada asked for some volunteers for some search and rescue training, so here I am. I'll see you after the break. One of the top dogs who works for Sada focuses on tracking the existence of Accelerant. I'm about to meet him and his owner, Axel. So Axel, we're here with your beautiful dog Storm, who's doing yep. a lot of investigating. <laughs> yes, he um, is. Can you tell us about this space here that we're in? Yeah, so we're really lucky. We've got this um, area, oil refinery or an old oil refinery that we can use, which provides us a lot of space, a lot, lot of different terrains to set up different searches. So we can try and simulate what it'll be trying to find someone when they're actually lost. Um, so yeah, it's a great training environment, provides a lot of different um, options for us. Yeah, I guess you want to make sure you're training the dogs on as varied kind of landscapes as possible. Yeah, we want to give them every sort of experience we can so that when they are actually following it in, you know, doing a real life search, then they can um, sort of have that experience first. So it's not sort of so new to them. Yeah, fantastic. So later on, we're going to see a little bit of the search and rescue training, but I understand your dog Storm has a bit of different training. Yeah, on. so training him up to be an accelerant detection dog. So, um, obviously very different um, sort of thing. So whether it be petrol, diesel, um, kerosene, things like that, things that you use to start fires. Um, so yeah, so it sort of helps indicate the seat of the fire, point of origin of the fire, that sort of thing. Oh wow, is the, is so they, the can idea. Even, they can even locate. Yeah, so because generally that'll be where all the petrol or whatever is, like there'll yeah. be a lot more sort of accelerant there so they can help identify that. Yeah, fantastic. What made you um, want to want to train in that kind of field? Uh, something a bit different and um, something that I sort of want to explore um, and sort of go down that path because Sada hadn't had an accelerant dog before, so this was a different thing and trying to, um, I guess, fulfil another another role that um, there aren't any other accelerant dogs that I'm aware of in Victoria. Um, wow. Hmm. So how do you go about? doing the training to, 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 to help your dog track accelerants? Yeah, so basically if something's got an odour, uh, we, you can train a dog to detect it. So um, dogs have roughly about 300 million olfactory sensors, which are sensors receptors in their nose, which processes smell. Um, for comparison, we have around 6 million. So wow. they can actually um, smell things that we can't smell or things that smell the same to us, they can actually de detect subtle differences and identify that. So it's just a matter of, um, putting the dog across the, the odour that you want him to smell and reinforcing that and then um, progressing from there. Yeah, and I know dif different dogs have different uh, reinforcers. What do you use to reinforce uh, Storm? Yeah, for him, he's, he's food-based, um, but other dogs, they use article rewards and, okay. and things like that. So you can train them differently, but being a lab, he's uh, quite a got quite a good food drive as you can imagine. Yeah I can imagine <laughs> um, and he, he seems like he's very keen as well he's very keen to learn and yeah. to, to work. Yeah well 
the scruff flea may be about one one in four hundred um, sort of dogs that actually can do this work because wow. it's not necessarily about the, the ability, but it's about them having the drive and actually wanting to do it. Yeah, is, you wouldn't want a dog thing. that wasn't interested and you had to kind of yeah. call them out yeah. every time. They've got to yeah, they've got to want to do it. If they don't want to do it, you're never going to. You know, they might do it when it's easy, but as soon as it gets a bit hard and a bit of protracted search, then, yeah, they're not going to want to do it anymore. So is a, you're looking for a dog that wants a challenge and you they want it to be a bit hard yeah, to, to yeah, work they want, they want the Yeah, they've got to have the drive and want to want to actually work it out and, and figure it out. Mm. If it gets too hard and the dog doesn't want to do that, then you're never going to get anywhere. So it's a real challenge for the, for the dog. Uh, is it a, a bit of a challenge for you when you're out in the ground working with yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. So you've got to consider things like the wind and, and mm. scent cones and things like that. And what's, also, a, what's a scent cone? <laughs> so where, where the source is, whatever the odour is, whether whether it's a person and yeah. the bacteria and breath and stuff coming off them or whether it be drugs, explosive, whatever it is, um, when the wind comes along, if the wind's blowing that way, then it's going to come out and gradually go out in the cone like right. that. And so that's where you'll see dogs, they'll go side to side to side and they're working each side of the scent cone. So as soon as they come out of the scent cone, they come back in and then they narrow in onto the Wow, onto that the must source. be amazing to watch when it's when they're first starting to yeah. get a handle on things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's a really good feeling when you can actually see the training paying off. Mm, absolutely. Mm. I guess you have to be very careful as a trainer as well that you're doing the right thing uh, yeah. as well as the dog. Yeah, there's... Because we're just harnessing the dog's natural ability mm -hmm. and just focusing in an area that we want. So you've got to be careful that you're not then taking away from that and you're allowing the dog to use it all its natural ability, just trying to focus it. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> well, I think we've lost Storm. I think Storm yeah, is he's, off adventuring. He's so off maybe adventuring. We should, maybe we should go find him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time to watch how a simulated search takes place. The team that we have now coming through the program is, they're great. You know, they're young dogs, um, they're not uh, pedigree dogs. Um, you'd have, in my trips overseas, a lot of them are just mixed breeds. Mm -hmm. um, something that you, um, that goes out of control in your backyard, well, those sort of dogs that uh, are the ones that we can harness yeah, that enthusiasm wow. into this area. Yeah, because so they want to be working. They, they want to be, be doing, working. Doing. We've been here for 20 years and we don't, I don't think that we've even been to some of the parts. So the, the dogs have a very, very good um, um, area to search. Mm. 
and we don't get bored, neither do the dogs. That's great. So, yeah. Well, it sounds like you do incredible work and um, the people at home should maybe look to see if they can make some donations, either financial or maybe if they've got a surgery coming up. If they have got a <laughs> surgery coming up, that's it. Just give me a call. Um, and also, you know, like we love people visiting um, oh, to great. see how the dogs, yeah. you know, are trained and, and so And maybe forth. some volunteers if people yeah, volunteers want and to come we, and help out. Exactly. So always onto different smells. Fantastic. So, the nose knows. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> What a fun episode. If you'd like to know more about Sada, their details are below. I'll see you next time. <laughs>